Hey everyone and welcome to another video guys and today we're going to be touching on some important advanced landing tips. Now yes this may be a little bit overwhelming, you may feel how the hell am I going to execute this in my own games but don't worry I'm going to keep it incredibly practical, very pragmatic and use plenty of examples and really tie things back to analogies so you can understand these concepts at a very deep level. Now our goal in lane at the most fundamental level is to create as many micro advantages in terms of XP and gold as possible. Now in order in order to do this, it's not as simple as just take good trades. Now, yes, that is what you need to do, but as I have alluded to in my previous two videos, there are a lot of underlying concepts that aren't commonly mentioned that drastically increase the likelihood of taking good quality trades. Now, today, the concepts we're going to cover are number one, lane positioning, number two, faking CS and CS mind games, number three, alternating dodging patterns, and lastly, reading enemy movement. Now, before we go into the league specific examples, guys, I want to share with you two real life examples to help better exemplify what we're going to cover today and the mindset that you guys need to adopt when watching this video. Now, on the left hand side, we have an image of American football. So if you're from NA right now watching this video, you probably have a pretty good idea of what the right wide receiver and the cornerback is. But for those of you who are maybe from Europe or Asia or whatever and don't follow American football, essentially here at the most simple level, the wide receiver needs to get around this cornerback so he can create space from him, catch the ball safely as it's passed to him, and gain as much ground as possible. Or even like score a touchdown or something like that. But anyway, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the wide receiver here. Now, if we were to get try and get round this cornerback, we wouldn't really want to make our movements very long, linear, obvious, because then the cornerback can, you know, tether us very effectively, stay right next to us, interrupt our movements, block us very effectively, essentially make our life a living hell. So, if we were to be the right wide receiver and try and get around this guy, we need to try and mask our movements. Maybe we need to fake, we need to use our position our feet in a certain way, or our hips in a certain way, or or somehow fake or masquerade our movements in order to get around this guy. So this is where, you know, positioning comes into play, faking comes into play, um, mind games come into play, because maybe the, the last three um, rotations of this specific setup, I went a certain way, but then I mix it up. So essentially, um, if you're the cornerback, for example, Again, you need to be assessing their movements. You need to think, oh, are they going to fake? Are they going to go this way? Which way are they going to go? You need to be tethering them. You need to be very, paying hardcore attention to all these little movements. Now, this is the exact same in League of Legends, which I'm going to get to in a second in terms of lane positioning, faking CS, alternating dodging patterns. These are all very, very important skills to develop in order to masquerade your movements so you can create micro advantages within the laning phase. Now, on the right-hand side here, again, we have a UFC analogy. It's very similar to boxing. And as you can see in this image here, we can see how this guy on the right-hand side is overreaching. Now, in League of Legends, if you overreach, you go too far, or maybe you position too aggressively in a certain way, you will get punished. But if you position too defensively, you're not really going to create any advantages. So, you, again, you've got to be tethering your opponent. You've got to be faking, creating situations in the future so you can punish and get, you know, maybe a small jab and get a little bit, bit of damage off. Or maybe you can block his ability, whatever. It's all around tethering. It's all about faking. It's all about movements, paying small attention to details, mind games. Um, all of these small little details that add up to create micro advantages and lead to a big win in the future. So this is the mindset that you guys have to develop um, when watching this video and in order to get the most out of this video. And this is essentially what we're going to cover today. Now for the importance of lane positioning. Now, lane positioning is an incredibly misunderstood concept in the mid lane community. And it's actually a key contributing factor for generating threats in the laning phase and creating situations to take favorable trades. Now, just like in NFL or boxing or basketball, we can force or alter the movements of the enemy through positioning in a certain way, ultimately masking our intentions at all times. So instead of talking and going through all these weird examples, let's get into the league specific examples, guys. So what we're going to do now, guys, is go through a series of examples, both from myself and some of my coaching clients to highlight what good and bad lane positioning looks like. So in this first example, I'm playing Oriana into Ari, and this was from a recent tier one clash VOD that I played on stream. Now, in this situation, what do we see with the wave state? I have three minions and Ari has three minions. 
Now, because the minions are deeper onto Ari's side, we know that her way is going to crash first, so it's actually going to start slow building out to me. Now, Ari, as a champion, is actually outranged by me, and Ari knows this way in advance that she needs to hard crash this wave because she can't afford to slow build a wave into Orianna because I can easily thin the wave with my range. And if I'm able to thin the wave, um, it may even turn into a freeze in which I'm too close to my tower, she can't all in me, and essentially she's going to eventually lose trades. So we'll see in a second as we play this VOD out, she's going to be very desperate to get the wave in. Now, I punish her for queuing the wave with a QWE, and I start walking back. Now, what do we see in this situation? The wave is in a nice spot for me, the next wave is about to crash, and Ari in this situation, she's panicking. She doesn't like this wave state whatsoever, she's slowly getting uh, poked out by me and harassed, so she's really trying to desperately get this wave in. Now, I don't want her to do that. I don't want to let her do that, right? Because if I let her get the wave in, it's going to come back out, and then that may even potentially, because I have no flash here, I might be vulnerable to a gank, or that would be better for Ari, given, given she has Ignite and she has Ultimate. And I don't want that. I want to keep the wave on my side, on my side, sorry, and slow poke her out of the lane. Now, because I know this, and I know what wave state I want, and she knows what wave state she wants, I'm going to position in a certain way to punish her for this, Okay. I don't want to be positioning all the way behind my minions because that's going to give her plenty of room to auto attack and queue the wave freely without getting punished. So let's play this out and we'll see with my positioning here. Notice how far up I am relative to my minion wave. I'm, or, I'm, I'm very close to my melees right now. I'm trying to stand behind the minion wave because obviously she has charm. I don't want to stand outside the minion wave. If she didn't have something like charm, then I would actually stand outside here. But the point is I'm trying to put the pressure on her through sheer positioning to prevent her from getting the wave in safely. Now, I walk up, I queue a little bit prematurely here, which actually gives her a little bit of a, spa a bit of space, but notice she's trying to queue the wave. Go back a little bit here, she's trying to queue the wave, and the only reason she's actually able to queue this wave in the first place is because I actually missed my queue. But again, I'm positioning very aggressively. I'm not sitting back here, which I see a lot of coaching clients do. They sit all the way back here, which gives already so much room to queue freely without me harassing, and auto-attack these minions down for free. She's not able to do that. Otherwise, she's going to take a QW to the face. I'm able to thin the wave quite aggressively here, and I'm trying to zone her away. She's not able even to auto these creeps either, because I'm trying to get in her face and simultaneously thin down the wave. Now, as you can see, this is a bit of a weird, a weird concept, but don't, don't worry, we're going to go through plenty of examples, guys. So this is a more clean example. So this is, again, me playing Orianna into Syndra. Now, in this situation, I see my Zac on, um, on his Raptors, and the wave is in a very good state for me. We're both level 2 here. I'm about to ding level 3. I know Syndra is about to ding level 3 as well, but Syndra does not like this wave state whatsoever. She needs to get this wave out, otherwise it's going to be held on my side. She's going to be very vulnerable to ganks, and, and, I, and essentially, I, again, I can walk past a mini wave and get very solid traits. So look at what Syndra tries to do here, and look at through how through my lane positioning, I prevent her from doing this, which actually stops her from getting the wave under my tower. So she's trying to get the wave in. Now look at my positioning here. Look at how aggressively I'm positioning, right next to my cannon, ma punishing her for, for getting that cannon creep. And again, positioning way past my minions here, taking aggressive trades, knowing that if she's spending time attacking me, she's not attacking this wave. So it's actually going to be frozen here for longer, because I know my jungler's in the area. And then, because I'm able to hold the wave here, and I was able to keep her there through my lane positioning, we're able to set up a nice little gank here onto the Syndra and get a beautiful little kill. So let's actually go back and watch that again, and really, without pausing it, so you can really see what it looks like in action. So again, she's trying to get this wave in. I don't want her to let her get this wave in. So again, I'm positioning aggressively, making her make a choice between me and the wave, forcing her into a trade with me. If I were to sit all the way behind my, my range creeps, all the way back here, then it's going to be a no-brainer. It's going to be incredibly easy for Syndra to get the wave in. She's, she's going to be full HP. It's going to be very easy for her. I'm putting the pressure on her. I'm making her make a choice. I'm altering her decision-making, her movements, her just overall lane positioning by doing something myself. You know, this is going back to the boxing thing and the NFL analogy, the American football analogy. I can alter, I can influence their movements with my movements. And then I keep her interested here without giving it away. And then we get that nice gank. So hopefully you're starting to see what I mean. Don't worry, we'll go through more examples here. 
Now again, I'm versing a cannon. Um, and in this situation, I get a nice little QW here. Again, look at my positioning here. Notice, I know I have the range advantage. I'm in a favorable matchup here. I want to slow build this wave. I don't want to allow Cannon to thin this wave because again, if you watch my previous videos on advanced wave manipulation, you generally always want to be slow building waves because slow building waves does everything better. It gives me more priority, more tempo reset opportunities or cheater recalls, whatever you call it. it gives me more time to get deeper vision. It allows me to do everything better. So I don't want to allow Cannon just to walk up and thin this wave with auto attacks. I want to abuse my range advantage. No, look at my look at my positioning here. If Cannon wants to walk up and thin the wave, Cannon has to take a QW to the face. There's a price. That's the that's just the, the cost of admission to, to touch my minion wave. You've got to take the QW to the face. Notice, look how aggressive my positioning is. To be honest, it actually could have been more aggressive here, but I was actually a little scared. I actually didn't know where Hecarim was in this specific example, so I wasn't playing overly aggressive. If I knew where Hecarim was, because I actually didn't have vision here either, I could have actually positioned very, very aggressively and actually punished Kennen for even auto-attacking these creeps as well. But um, I didn't until now, and then I saw Hecarim topside here. But anyway, um, even now, this is a little bit of a... I don't like my positioning there. That was actually very bad positioning. I should never be all the way back here. I should always be up here. This is actually bad positioning. And notice how Cannon isn't really able to touch the wave as much as he would have if my positioning was much more aggressive. But anyway, keep this, this VOD going. Because I slow built the wave, I didn't slow build it perfectly. I'm able to get a few extra auto attacks on the tower that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Now on this next wave, look at this. I know Hecarim's topside, so I can, as long as I lean onto bot side here, I'm pretty sure I can actually uh, position quite aggressively. And again, look at my positioning. In the lane. I see Hecarim. Look at my positioning here. I'm, I'm past my minions. Kennen can't walk up and auto attack this wave. He's not going to be, I'm not letting him thin this wave. And I'm doing this through my positioning in the lane. I'm making it incredibly difficult for him to touch my wave. And look at that. If he wants to walk up and push me back, I'm, I'm happy to take that trade. If he wants to touch the wave, I'm going to poke him. And then because of that, again, I was able to, you know, get a solid trade and um, get the wave in quite safely. Now, again, me versus Heimerdinger. Now, in this example, it's the same concepts. Look at, look at my positioning again. I'm not sitting all the way back here. I'm not letting Heimerdinger walk up and touch the wave for free. If Heimerdinger wants to touch my wave and, and, and actually thin the wave or CS, he has to use his abilities. And then what happens? If the Heimerdinger uses his abilities on the minions, then he's wasting resources on the minions and not me. I'm able to generate more threat because his abilities are going to be on cooldown, whereas mine aren't. Or he's going to walk up and get in range for my abilities in the first place in which I take a good trade or we just trade HP for HP. Or he goes for abilities on me and misses the creeps completely. So look at this. Again, look at my positioning here, guys. I'm forcing Heimerdinger from max range to W. I'm not standing behind my creeps here. I'm, I'm positioning literally in line with my creeps. And now Heimer does a great job putting a turret there. But because of my positioning, I was able to build, or actually get the wave in largely without Heimer touching it at all. Now, one other thing of this example, and the great thing about lane positioning, is that... Um, it actually snowballs, because if I'm able to build a wave like this and force the Heimer to CS under tower, then um, Heimer's going to be, again, most likely using abilities to last it here, or completely miss the abilities in the first place, in which they're using resources, their cooldowns, when I mean, their abilities are going on cooldown, in which I'm already able to direct my damage onto the next wave. So if I can actually hard push this next wave, and in some situations, if we're talking about level 3, level 4, level 5, level 6, every level can completely change the, the amount of pressure I get the entire next wave because I might get I might ding level 6 off this wave first as a result and generate kill threat or whatever. So essentially, because I was able to do what I did with the last wave, this gives me more control over the next wave in which I can just hard push and get to skirmishes way before the enemy can. So as you can see, there's a bit of a, a snowball nature to lane positioning. And to better describe the snowball nature of lane positioning, you can kind of see it here with this Lucian. This Lucian in the early game hit a bunch of Qs onto me and forced me back. And because he's a little bit stronger than me, actually harasses me in the early game here, he's able to have a lot more control over the lane. So he's able to get level 3 first, which actually pushes me back further. It makes me more scared to thin the wave. So because of him 
um, landing more skill shots to me and playing quite aggressively, I'm not able to walk up and thin the wave and use abilities onto him because I'm more scared. So as you can see, there's a little bit of a snowball nature of lane posi positioning, sorry, especially in the early game with levels. Now, before we go into the the next whole concept of faking CS, etc., there is another concept, and I probably mentioned this in my other videos, of uh, called holding abilities and the importance of holding abilities. Now, this goes hand in hand with lane positioning. Now, I'm going to go through an example here quickly to talk about the importance of holding abilities. Now, in this situation, I'm the Orianna versing a Cassadin. Now, if I use my Q and miss the Cassadin, then what does that mean? The Cassadin knows that I can, you know, Cassadin thinking to himself, well, oh, I can actually walk up and thin the wave quite easily with auto attacks because Orianna doesn't have any abilities. And sometimes, in a lot of matchups, if you just simply hold the ability without using it, the threat of the ability itself can give you more control over the wave than if you otherwise threw it out and missed it. That's actually very uh, prevalent when you're playing champions like Zoe with your bubble, or even in support, if you're playing Thresh and Blitzcrank with the hook. Simply holding the ability generates more threat. It's the, it's the threat of the ability itself. Now here, I threw my Q out, and that actually allows Cassidy to auto-attack the wave two or three times when he would have otherwise been potentially scared to uh, walk up and get the wave out. Now, he makes the same mistake as me. Instead of holding his Q for my Q, he actually Qs my face randomly, in which, wait, what? Okay, you're not allowed to touch the wave anymore. So then I can actually Q W because he wasted his abilities and get a really, really solid trade on the back end. So as you can see here, holding abilities are very important. Now, this is actually an example. I did a coaching session today actually with a Discord member. Um, this was, I believe, Diamond 3, around Diamond 3 NA. And I just thought this was a very good example of the importance of holding abilities and the lack of lane control or lane positioning. So he's playing Swain in this situation. Sorry for the quality here. Um, and he's versing a Zed. Now, he has Catalyst, but he does not have Flash. He doesn't have any defensive summoners right now. His Bone Plating, I think, is about to come back up. But I believe this Zed doesn't have Alt and doesn't have Ignite. So this Zed's actually quite weak as well. Now, in this situation, Swain just wants to farm for 1,500 gold. He wants to go for his rower, come back, and then start to exert pressure on the map. But here, look how much, look how much respect he's giving this Zed for no real reason. Look how far back he is right now. For no reason. He has a side to lean onto. He can easily lean onto one side. Make Zed make a choice between him and the wave. Well, to be honest with you... Zed going for a full trade onto the onto the Swain is actually terrible because he's not going to be able to kill the Swain with no ult and no ignite. On top of that, Swain actually has bone plating coming up in half a second now, in which if Zed did that combo, it really wouldn't do too much damage. And that if Zed used a full combo, WEQ combo onto the Swain, Swain, Swain can be like, alright, well, whatever, I soak up most of it with my, with my bone plating, I'm just going to get the wave anyway and recall, because off this wave I get 1500 gold and I'm resetting regardless. In which then you get the tempo reset over the Zed. There's no real point of giving pressure here. You should always be thinking, oh, okay, I'm basing on this next wave anyway. Taking damage doesn't really mean much, so I don't need to give lane control. And on top of that, you could at least threaten or fake walking up and maybe stand behind this creep, maybe stand behind this creep over here or, or whatever and actually force him back so he can't just auto-attack the wave down, right? You don't want to allow your enemy to auto-attack the wave down for free. And especially after Zed just uses his Q on the wave like that, that's a. Uh, this is giving way too much respect when he's Q's down like that. And again, the importance of holding abilities. Now Swain doesn't have access to E because he timed it poorly. This again sends a signal to the Zed saying, um, you know, you've basically sent a signal saying, oh, okay, I can't really damage you anymore, so you can do whatever you want with the wave. So this is the importance sometimes of holding abilities. If he didn't use it and just held it, Maybe Zed wouldn't have been able to auto-attack like the wave he's doing right now, or position this aggressively. Notice how defensive this, how defensive this entire um, lane positioning is, and the lack of holding abilities can really give the enemy control over the lane. Now, in this example here, this is another coaching client. I believe his name's Raz. He's from the Discord as well, and this is around gold. I believe this is. A was it gold one or gold two or gold three? It was it was mid. I think it was mid to high gold. I believe off the top of my head. Now, this was a game where he was playing Syndra into Vega. Now, when watching this VOD, guys, I want you to now, given all the previous uh, examples I've shown you um, for the past few minutes, I want you to compare that lane positioning and use that concept to see what's going wrong in this laning phase. 
So here he's playing, you know, he's playing a champion that spikes relatively early comparatively to Vega. Vega is a very immobile, semi low range champion. Um, and there's no real reason for Sindra to be scared at this point. Especially since he can take good trades like that. These constant nice little Q trades, timing it with the CS, that sort of thing. So that Q was great. Not too bad. Now, look at the distance between the Syndra and the Vega. Look at it's like it's like a football field from them two to here. There's a little football field between the two of them right now. He should be getting up. Making him make a choice, ideally this ward should be positioned more aggressively because in order to, you know, do proper lane positioning, you need to have solid warding because if you don't have solid warding, then again, you're not going to be able to position aggressively. But warding aside, let's just say that he put this ward in a great spot where he knew the jungle was topside, although he should know the jungle is topside based on basic jungle tracking. But um, he should not really feel the need to be this scared, especially since he even has this ward as well. So he can um, definitely lean onto one side here. But as you can see here, he's not able to effectively make Vega uh, make a choice between the wave and, and, and him. So what's actually happening is that Vega can effectively thin the wave, even though he's playing incredibly scared as well for no real reason. Um... This is, again, kind of like a mixture of lack of tethering and micro as well. But for the sake of this example, I just want to talk purely about lane positioning. Um, because Raz here isn't putting the pressure on and preventing Vega from thinning the wave, Vega is able to keep the wave on his side for an extended period of time. Now, I see this all too often with my coaching clients. They do this sort of thing where they give way too much respect. They give up way too much lane control like this. They're not making the enemy make a choice between you and the wave. You're not putting pressure, or at least fainting pressure onto them, in which the wave will just stay in an unfavorable position for a very long time. Now, now, one thing I haven't really mentioned in the previous examples, and this is very, very important, and tying it back to the American football example, you think that they are gonna, like, they're not gonna make their movements very obvious and linear, right? They're gonna fake things. Now, in this example, Sindri can walk up and pretend she's gonna play super aggressive. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know the way you're gonna play your Syndra. You can play very aggressively, maybe for one or two cues, and then relax it, but then fake that pressure by walking up and, and posturing aggressively to generate threat to force them off the wave. You can you don't have to make your your movements very linear. You don't, you don't have to be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna queue and then walk back because my queue's on cooldown. A lot of the time, guys, they're not gonna know the exact cooldowns of your abilities. It's your positioning and your threat levels and how what, what, what you're trying to, how you, like, you need to send a message to the enemy. You can't just, like, make your movements very telegraphed and play this very defensive, giving up lane position style of League of Legends. Now, this ties directly into one of the most toxic habits you can possibly have in League of Legends called backclicking. Now, this is especially prevalent with supports and AD carries. Yes, you see it in the mid lane. Now, this is something that I would urge you to look at within your VOD review. When I was working with some of the rookie players trying to go pro in 2019, these were players that were, you know, probably average rank master tier, grandmaster, trying to reach challenger. One of the most toxic habits is back clicking. Now you see it with Raz here. His default response every single time after like using a Q or um, doing something is to just click super, super far back. Look at this. He go and just clicks back. He'll go for a Q, go for a, go for a minion. He'll just click back. It's this really weird, bad habit where I think it actually stems from a lack of understanding of jungle tracking or lack of proper warding or whatever it is. But if you're not hyper aware of it, it can stay as a bad habit for a very long time. If we go back all the way to the start of this example, you'll see it all the way from the beginning here. Q, and look, just walk back. Walk back. Give up all this lane positioning. And you'll notice when you watch a lot of pro players... They barely click back. They might click back the tiniest bit, but mainly they just keep going forward or stay in a line. They're, not, they're never trying to give the lane positioning over to the enemy. They're trying to generate as much threat as possible. Because if, if, if this Vega is not like, you know, AFKing or whatever, I don't know what the hell this Vega is doing. Vega would be up here thinning this wave with Q and auto attacks and keeping the wave outside his tower. So again, this is a little bit of a weird concept. I'm hoping I kind of got it across in, in these examples here, guys. Um, but I urge you to look at it within your own VODs and really start to view your laning phase not super... Make, don't make your laning phase or your positioning super obvious. Masquerade your intention. 
at all times. Now for faking CS and mind games with CS. So as you've seen so far in the examples, guys, the laning phase can actually be sometimes best thought of as like a dance, right? A constant push and pull between two players. So one of the most constant factors between each game, guys, is the minion waves, right? The minion waves always come out. There's always a few normal waves and there's a cannon wave, that sort of thing. So because it's a very constant factor that happens every single game, we need to see the minions as a tool to play mind games with the enemy to take favorable trade. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples, guys. So in this example here, guys, I'm playing Orianna into a Scion mid lane. So we know if the Scion plays incredibly defensively and gives up a lot of lane control, I'm going to be able to take very easy favorable trades with my QWE, auto attack, run away with phase rush, and essentially I'm going to dominate the entire early landing phase and Scion is never going to be able to get a solid reset or get any pressure or basically do anything in the entire game. So at some point, the Scion has to walk up to get the CS in, take a pretty unfavorable trade as a long-term investment in order to get the wave in to maybe get a reset off, get a roam down, or whatever he wants to do with his champion, especially now that he's, you know, post six. So if we take a look here, Scion uh, max range Qs and actually walks up in a second to last hit these creeps here, knowing that, yes, he's going to take a bit of damage, but he needs to do this um, in order to, you know, get the wave out, thin the wave so we can get a decent reset for himself, spend the gold or whatever. This is what we call like maybe like a long-term investment. Now, in this situation, he's been doing this again and again and again. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, this is free trades. I can keep doing these QWE combos or just QW auto trades and just harass this Scion down. I'm thinking, oh, I've hit the jackpot here. This guy's not that good, whatever. So if, if we know, if you watch my videos as Oriana, you ideally want to be timing your QW combo or your poke down when the minions are low because this is a clear-cut indicator that this is where they're going to be. So it's very reliable to hit your poke. Now, in this situation, the Scion's very smart. He knows that he know, he's read my movements. He knows exactly what my game plan is. He knows that I'm going to 100% of the time go for a, a QW combo as Sion, as he goes up for this minion. So he knows that, right? So in a second, I'm thinking, oh, this is super, super easy. He walks up and instead of lasting it with an auto attack, he shoves it into me and takes a really good trade onto me, forces me back, gets very solid lane positioning and is able to actually get the wave in effectively. I've used a bunch of mana for no reason. It's very difficult for me to hold a cannon wave here without using too much mana and he's actually got the wave in effectively. Okay, this is what we call faking CS, or as you can start to see, mind games with CS. And this is a very important concept to understand, and especially if you play Assassins. Now, if you play melee, any melee mid essentially, if you just play very linear, obvious, defensive, last hit, only last hit, only last hit, you will slowly lose trades against champions like a Victor, or a Orianna, or an Azir, or an Acasio. You have to, at some point, mix it up. Use mind games to get a favorable trade. Say I'm playing um, Fizz here, for example. Say this sounds actually a Fizz, and I'm playing Oriana here. This Fizz will know, okay, you know, maybe I've done this maybe two or three times where I've made my, my movements very obvious, and then uh, Oriana has gone for a QW onto me. Great, I know, I've recognized the pattern, I've realized that Oriana's going to poke me, now I can mix it up. Now, instead of going for this minion, I'll actually walk straight past it, or Q through it, or E over it, go onto the Oriana, and take a very good trade. This is the perfect way to, again, close the gap versus a lot of these range matchups. And... When you verse more, I guess, lower range mid laners, because Oriana can be a little bit tricky, a lot of these range mid laners are going to actually close the gap in order, because they, they're so confident that you're going to go for this creep, in which you can actually just dash straight, on, straight onto them, or get a really, really favorable trade. And especially if you're playing champions like LeBlanc, Fizz, Aurelia, any of them, it's, ex it's a very, very effective tool. And Sion did it perfectly here, caught me off guard, and... Um, yeah, is exactly what I'm, I'm trying to talk about. And it ties in, again, ties into that NFL, that American football example, or the boxy example, where you might fake something or mix up the pattern to, to create a favorable trade in the long run. It ties into that long-term investment, the small wins mentality. So, into the next example. So, in this next example, um, this was, again, a clash game where I'm playing Corky into Akali. Now, in this example, this Akali's played relatively defensively. Um, I'm quite confident. I've got two corrupting pots here. I've actually got my pickaxe. I've um, got my fleet footwork. I've got an entire plate by myself. 
And because the Sakali's played quite defensively so far, she's never really eat onto me or like done anything crazy. I'm like, oh, okay, well maybe this this Sakali's just not that good. So in my in the moment, my my thought process was, okay, Akali's probably just going to safely try and last hit these three remaining casters under the tower. So I actually walk up quite aggressively here, thinking, and, the, and even her movement, she looks like she's actually just walking here to last hit. But look what she does here. Instead of just walking up to last hit, she just goes straight onto me. She's abusing my my lack of, or like mixing up her patterns, and yes, I get hit by the E here, but the only reason I put myself in a position to get hit by the E is because I wasn't expecting it whatsoever. Okay, you can flame me all you want for my positioning, and yes, it was objectively bad, but the only reason I put myself in that position because she had never done that before, and I thought she was just going to safely go for the CS here, and she just goes on to me, and, and I actually effectively tether her Q range quite quite decently here, um, yeah, but the premise remains the same, where she didn't just safely CS under tower, she didn't play like a bitch, she, was, she knew that this sort of trading is very good for her, she's playing a a melee into a range, and she wants to create chaos. I'm a scaling mage who just wants to get to my mana mune. I don't want this sort, these sorts of trades. And she wins these all-in trades versus me. She actually forces the exhaust out of me or whatever. To be honest, I actually didn't even need to exhaust. But um, yeah, the premise remains the same. You can kind of see what I'm trying to get across here, guys. Now for dodging patterns in reading enemy movement. So just like the wide receiver and the cornerback in American football, we can alter our movements or our footwork or our hip placement or the way we're moving our, our shoulders or we can bait out abilities or dodge abilities or avoid movements or whether it's boxing, bait out a punch or bait out a movement from the from the cornerback to make them move one way while I go the other way. We can dodge abilities and bait out abilities abilities with all through altering our movements and our inputs as well as read the enemy movements to foresee their intention so this ties actually directly into the small wins mentality where every single little bit of damage or trade adds up cumulatively to create favorable situations in the future and the better we get at this guys the less likely you will die to ganks especially in low elo where most players make their movements in, or, or their intention, sorry, incredibly, incredibly obvious. So let's actually go ahead and take a look at a few examples, guys. So in this example here, guys, I'm playing Oriana into a Kennen mid lane. Now, this again was from an example of my tier one class the other day on stream. So whenever I'm playing a skill shot oriented champion, whether it's Victor, Oriana, Zoe, whatever it is, in this case, Oriana with my Q, I like to throw out one or two Qs in the early lane just to assess their dodging patterns. Do they have short, sharp, concise movements? Do they have very long, elongated telegraph movements? How good are their dodging patterns? So I threw out one or two cues, and, I, and so far, I, I think I threw out one or two so far, and I could see that this cannon's movements were relatively short, sharp, and concise. Like, they actually, they actually weren't too bad at all. So um, in a second, you're going to see me. I'm, I'm trying to assess, okay, given they're, they're relatively close to his character, he's gone back and forth. Like you can see him kind of walk back and forth like this, they're relatively close to his character, I'm thinking, alright, well if I throw my Q relatively close to his model, it may hit, and likely hit, because he has been doing his very short, sharp, concise movements, I didn't expect him to do very long, linear movements, and because he's mixed up his dodging patterns a little bit here, he actually does one long, linear movement, he was able to actually get that last hit on that creep, now yes, that's a little bit piss poor for me, I think that was quite obvious in hindsight, but in the game, at a very practical, pragmatic way, I was quite confused because I was focusing on his movements and I wasn't able to read his movement. Now, the reason this is relevant to not even just high elo players but lower elo players is if your movements are very telegraphed, long, linear, similar to Raz in that previous gold example, it's very easy for people to dodge your abilities. It's very easy for them to essentially tether you. Um, and, it, and this is actually one of the big reasons why Smurfs, when they go into gold or even like a you know a Grandmaster Smurf goes into platinum, the get, the laning phases are incredibly easy because they're they're clicking or they're dodging pattern, they're tethering. All of these little details are so easy to punish. That's what allows me, if I were to go play in gold, to land every single skill shot or to eventually you know, trade over the course of three minutes, take all of their HP and get a solo kill. That just doesn't happen in Hyalu because I shouldn't be able to land all of them or should be very difficult for me to land all of them, or these players should know how to alternate their dodging patterns, or fake CS, or or position it in a certain way in the lane to generate threat onto me, to, uh, to actually force me to be scared 
and not be able to freely slow poke the enemy out of lane. So hopefully it's all starting to click here. Now, in this example, as you can see, if we go back, this person had very short, sharp, concise movements. This was a clip from, again, the grand final. And I just come straight back to lane. He actually just come off a reset as well. And look how, because this Lucian had very, has very linear movements going back to lane, I was able to land a max range QE combo when I never would, never in... Uh, in a million years should be able to do a max range QE combo, but just because Lucian's uh, movements were very linear, it was very easy for me to land it. Like that. So easy for me to land that stun and get this combo off my, with my Bard, because those movements were so incredibly linear. Let's actually look at that one more time. It walks back to lane. Boom. And as you can see, it actually looks like this, this Lucian actually just clicked right click onto this minion. And that's also why, by the way, tying back to the micro and the tethering video, um, that I did when I talked about, you know, uh, Faker, who has very good micro, uh, Knight has very good micro, they click all the way very close to their character, or they'll click multiple times around the minion before they last it, because they don't want to make their movements very linear, that's why these players, they click, the good players, they'll click so often, and their clicks are so rapid, going back and forth, back and forth, because again, they don't want to make their movements very linear, long, elongated, so this thing really can't happen. Or if they see the input, if they literally see this input, because they're clicking so close, they can instantly react to the side. Without even really having to, to use dash in this, in this specific case. So we got that nice little trade. Now for reading enemy movements, guys. So this is an example, again, from the Tier 1 Clash stream the other day. Me playing Orianna into this Heimerdinger. Now this Heimerdinger actually was not a mid player. They weren't really that good. And they were playing relatively defensively the entire early laning phase. So I'm thinking, all right, this guy just knows he gets outranged. He's going to play very defensively. I'm just going to chill and relax. Now, in this situation, because he was playing defensively very, at least for the entire levels 1 to 3, I was thinking to myself, okay, this guy's going to sit behind the creeps, allow me to get the wave out. Now, in this situation, usually I'll actually walk up and actually auto-attack these creeps, holding onto my QW, like I said in the previous examples, to generate threat, which will actually force Heimendinger back because he doesn't want to take a QW to the face, and um, that will allow me to auto-attack the wave down and get the wave out safely without it kind of freezing here. Now, Heimendinger actually does a good job. He actually... Um, he actually walks up here quite aggressively and abuses that my QW was on cooldown and walks up quite aggressively here. Now, because this Heimerdinger was playing quite defensively the entire early lane, I'm thinking to myself, well, I think this means Hecarim's here. Yes, if this was a better player and he was positioning like this often throughout the laning phase, then yes, I wouldn't really know what his intention was, right? Because his intention would be masked because he was doing that all the time. But because this guy had played defensively all the time and then he randomly started posturing aggressively like he did here, like he's randomly posturing aggressively here in line with his minions, I knew that something was up here and I'm able to relatively, you know, I don't really escape the gank, I still have to burn flash, but that's just my bad, but I still definitely had a hunch that Hecarim was coming. Now, it's even more obvious in this example. Again, Heimerdinger is positioning very defensively behind his minions, playing like a bitch, essentially, and then randomly, he starts, I mean, he, he takes a QW to the face after that, but if, randomly, he starts, like, walking up very aggressively, and I'm like, alright, I'm just gonna QE you, run away, whatever, and even after he uses stun, he's still positioning aggressively. I'm like, alright, man, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You play defensively the whole lane, and then randomly you do that, and then Hecarim shows up. Like, it's very obvious what the intention actually is. So, if, yes, if this Heimendinger were to position this aggressively all the time, or if they, were, if they were playing like this for the majority of the laning phase, then yes, his intention would be largely masqueraded. I wouldn't know what he's trying to do. I wouldn't know if he's setting up a gank, or that's just the way he's playing the laning phase. That is why lane positioning and mind games and, you know, posturing aggressively and generating threat all the time is such an important skill to develop. This is actually why, by the way, um, when, again, smurfs, if you're a smurf in like, like a grandmaster smurf going to gold, you can largely just position aggressively, they're going to be shit scared, give up all CS, give up all lane control, and make their movements very linear, very obvious, and essentially you're just going to be able to completely run over the entire laning phase. Positioning, threat, aggression, masquerades your intention at all times. If you make it very obvious, go defense, offense, defense, offense like this, your, your movements are so easy to read. And this is very important for you lower ELO players, or to be honest with you, anything below D4, this is going to be a very easy skill to, uh, or something that you'll easily be able to point out in your VOD reviews. Now, 
Um, fast forwarding a little bit here, this was an example of me hiding my intention. So this is later on in the VOD, and my set was about to come and gank this Heimerdinger from the top side. Now notice, even though um, my set is here, no, look at my positioning. I'm playing very patient. I'm not walking up whatsoever. And as soon as set goes, then I walk up. I don't go in first. I don't. I, I masquerade my intention. I'm actually trying to bait this Heimerdinger in, keeping my distance here, making it very like really hiding my intention here, trying not to make it as obvious as possible, just acting natural. And um, and because of that, Heimendinger kind of overextended here and we're able to get a nice little kill. And again, to show another example here, me getting pushed in by this Lucian. I'm just doing the usual here. And then I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to walk up, pretend I'm ordering this. And then I go for a QE onto this Lucian to make it as, as subtle as possible. And then we get a nice little gank off onto this Lucian here. So as you can see, these maybe aren't the best examples, but it's the mindset behind hiding my intention. I'm not making my intention very obvious. If I walk up very aggressively beforehand and like all this stuff randomly out of nowhere, then he's going to just gun it. He's just going to run away. But I'm waiting to the last possible second um, to masquerade my intention. The exact same as this one before, going to the last possible second. Um, making my intention very unclear. So if you're still unsure about any of these concepts, guys, feel free to reach out to me um, in the comment section or in the Discord. I'm happy to um, you know, point you in the right direction or whatever. And I'm sure there's plenty of people on the Discord who, who now, hopefully watching this video, have a better understanding of the concept. So go into your VOD reviews, guys. Get into the details. Get into the nitty gritty. And this is all of the advanced laning stuff that really pays dividends over the course of a long laning phase. And again, yes, there's a lot. It may be a little bit over overwhelming but take your time this is why league is a very in-depth game it takes years to refine them hopefully with my content i can uh, help speed up that process for you guys so cheers guys thanks for watching and um i'll see you guys around the discord cheers